Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Woodward, and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which is the public policy division and educational arm of Travelers Insurance. Welcome again to Wednesdays with Woodward, a webinar series where we convene leading experts for conversations about today's biggest challenges. And we have a lot of them in today's current environment, both geopolitical and economic. So we're glad you're here. And before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's program. I would also like to thank our webinar partners for today, the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, the Masters in FinTech program at UConn, and the Metro Hartford Alliance. So welcome. Today, we are tackling one of our most requested topics, the state of the housing market and what's really going on. The residential real estate market has been buffeted over the past several years by really hot prices, eye-popping bidding wars, low inventories, builder supply chain challenges and issues, and now we have rising inflation with rapidly rising mortgage interest rates. We all want to know, where is this headed, and what does it mean for the broader economy? So today, I'm thrilled to announce our guest the National Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Lawrence Yoon. Lawrence is going to share his outlook for the residential and commercial housing markets. A lot's going on with the commercial housing markets in cities across the United States post pandemic. So we wanna know about that as well. In addition to his role as Chief Economist, Lawrence oversees the entire research group at the National Association of Realtors he supervises and is responsible for really a wide range of economic research, including the NIR's existing home sales statistics, the affordability index, which is important for all of us, and the home buyers and sellers profile report, all of which you can find on the National Association of Realtors website. So uh, Lawrence provides regular commentary uh, and has received nearly 1.6 million realtors out there who are members. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Maryland. And I might note for all of us who are very active on LinkedIn, and if you're not on LinkedIn, really think about joining. It's a wonderful way to understand what's going on in today's marketplace. If you are on LinkedIn, he's really a great resource and a good person to follow for those real-time insights on real estate and the broader economy. So I invite you to join both Lawrence and I on LinkedIn. So Lawrence, I'm gonna let you uh, take over the virtual floor for a few minutes. You have a chock full of uh, data and statistics for us to kind of really sift through. And then we'll be back for a moderated discussion. And we really want to get to a lot of your questions. We listen to your survey feedback and we understand you want us to ask more of your questions on our webinar. So we're going to do that uh, today as well. So Lawrence, thank you for joining us. And the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Joan, uh, for inviting me uh, and Travelers Institute. Of, I'm glad to uh, share some of my thoughts on this transitioning real estate market. Uh, and it is undergoing quite a rapid transition. Uh, let me put it on a full screen mode so you can see it better. So the market, uh, as Joan, you referred to, was super hot the past two years multiple offers were a very common phenomenon. There was a tremendous degree of frustration last year where home buyers got outbid by somebody else. So having to restart that process all over again, having to waive home inspection, uh, which is uncomfortable, yet people were forced to do knowing so much other buyer competition. But that has all changed. Today, the buying activity is running 20, 25, even in some cases, 40% below what it was one year ago, depending upon the location, 40% reduction in home sales activity. For the most part, the home prices are still above one year ago. Maybe it has already peaked in some markets and showing some declines, and maybe we will see continuous some degree of decline, uh, but it is still the median prices being comfortably above one year ago levels. The number, the appreciation number will no doubt steadily shrink, and maybe it will even reach zero mark on a nationwide basis. 
So when we say national home prices increase by zero, say a few months from now or maybe sometime next year, it means that half of the country will be experiencing some declines while other half of the country will be experiencing increases. So let's first move over to the first chart which shows the mortgage rates. So this is a mortgage rate trend from 1990s onward. Any economic variable, any financial market variable, we know it fluctuates up and down. But the overall trend has been downward, downward, downward from 1990s all the way until the beginning of this year. From this year, as you can see, rapidly rising. So first, why was it declining before this year? Well, it was declining because inflation was a non-issue. Consider a lender. Lender lends the money out, hopes to make some interest income from it so they get their money uh, returned to them. If there is a high inflation, of course, then they would have lost the purchasing power. They're getting the interest, but the interest is unable to cover 8% higher consumer prices. So in a time of non-existing inflation, mortgage rate can decline, as happened. But today, we are in a high inflationary environment, and therefore, the lenders are charging much higher. The indirect process is, of course, the Federal Reserve is raising their short-term interest rate, the mortgage market, mortgage-backed security market, trying to readjust to all that situation. So you see that mortgage rate today has climbed to 7% from 3% of last two years, 7% mortgage rate. I put that three red bar for people who are involved in the stock market, bond market trading, uh, and it's something called resistance point. It's one of those trading unrelated to economic news. It's more of a momentum trading where suddenly there's a massive buying simultaneously or massive selling uh, occurring at the simultaneously uh, among the Wall Street traders. So resistance point is in essence like a wall. Once you hit the wall, it begins to come back down. So generally speaking, resistance point would say you hit the wall, then you retreat, as you can see on these lines. So this year, when the mortgage rate began to increase and reached the same point as the first resistance, the first lower level bar, it could either hold at that level or burst through. And what do you know, it just went right past it as if the wall did not even exist. And once that happened, it makes a big gain, not a small gain, but a big gain until the next resistance point is established. And the next resistance point is where we are today at 7% mortgage rates. So critical juncture, if it holds at this level, possibly mortgage rate can retreat back down to maybe 6.5% before retesting at seven and see where it goes. But if it somehow bursts through this 7% resistance, then one is looking at the next resistance, which is at 8.5%, something that we do not want to see certainly our members realtor members do not want to see but that is a possibility if it burst through so we are at this critical juncture first thing i do every morning is i look at the 10-year treasury yield what is the interest rate on that that would be in essence the borrowing rate by the federal government i am here in washington dc uh, the street is fairly light because, you know, federal employees still, for the most part, are working from home. Uh, it's up to the individual supervisors to determine uh, their work policy. But many are evidently working from home because downtown is still empty, uh, which actually raises the question about the office market. And I'm not sure how my microphone picks up outside noise. But at times there's little siren because we are just a couple of blocks from the US Capitol. Uh, so there's often sirens going on. But aside from that, I look at the US Treasury yields because uh, US government is running a budget deficit. We are borrowing more money. So that is the interest rate that the government would pay in essence. And the mortgage rate, given the backing of Fannie and Freddie, government sponsored institution, 
it is slightly above the U.S. government borrowing rate. So you see the two graphs almost moving similarly together. At times, the gap is a little wider than normal. And today, it is much wider than normal. Mortgage rate is at 7%, 10-year Treasury is at 4%. This is a 300 basis point difference or three percentage point difference. Normally, it would be only half that, 150 basis point difference. So in a sense, if we had a normal spread, mortgage rate today would be 6% and not 7%. So worth investigating as to why it is so wide. I mean, is that the case that Federal Reserve is unloading some of the mortgage-backed securities they had purchased? So it's leading to this larger spread? Or is it the case that possibly uh, that uh, the market, mortgage servicing market, is not as competitive as we thought? So anytime there's less competition, uh, there could be more market power to influence some of the financial variables but it's very widespread under normal circumstances mortgage rate today would be six percent rather than seven percent but the mortgage rate is what it is and is high rapidly rising and therefore our contract signings pending home sales contract has been falling falling and falling it always moves in the exact opposite direction with the mortgage rates. This graph is from early 2020, right before COVID. So you can, in essence, say the red bar is the pre-COVID sales activity. All the data are seasonally adjusted. We know that spring months are much stronger than winter, so we adjust the data to remove some of the seasonality. So what we are saying is, in essence, that early months of COVID lockdown, we were stuck at home, people could not buy property, so he sank. But once the economy reopened, a bursting of home buying demand. First, record low mortgage rate. People wanted to take advantage of it. Increased purchasing power from low interest rates and remote work possibility. So all this factor contributed to very active home sales activity way above pre-COVID days. But beginning of this year, when the mortgage rate began to rise, contract signings declined, declined, declined. And depending upon the market, it's running 20% below one year ago, 30% or even 40% below one year ago. In the meantime, U.S. home prices are still holding on, relatively speaking. There is some indication that California markets are beginning to buckle. So in San Francisco, prices are already past peak, and maybe by this time next year, prices could be 10% lower in San Francisco area. The reason why San Francisco or California market would be more impacted is simply that they are expensive. An expensive market always is more vulnerable to changes in mortgage rate. Changes in mortgage rate has the same percentage impact, whether in Indianapolis, or in say San Diego, but the nominal dollars is quite large in San Diego in terms of a monthly required payment. And consequently, we see more adjustment in expensive areas. But US medium home price, as you can see, uh, is at essentially near record high. There's some seasonal decline that occurs every year as we enter the winter months. Uh, but if you look at the beginning of the chart, you see some degree of price bubble. In hindsight, we can say that because prices crash 30%. But that was led by those funny, shady, risky subprime mortgages. No income documentation, teaser rate is simply imploded, uh, and we had a crisis. Thankfully, we don't have those risky mortgages. Today, people had to qualify for that all the income requirement, various ratio to get a mortgage, and consequently, homeowners, in fact, are smiling. I mean, they are seeing weakness in the housing market, but the homeowners broadly are smiling to say, I locked in at 3%, and I have seen a tremendous price growth over the past two years, which is my wealth. So homeowners are quite content, uh, and there is no uh, weakness, softness in the home price market uh, at the moment, just holding on. 
If we look at the affordability index, uh, it's an index that our organization created many years ago, comprising of three factors, home prices, income, and mortgage rates. Very three simple, three variables. Higher the affordability index, easier to buy, or more Americans are in a position to buy. Lower the affordability, more difficult to buy. So today it is at multi-year low in affordability, combination of high prices uh, and higher rising mortgage rate cutting into affordability. The last time the affordability index was this low, as you can see, is 2006, when the home prices were just peaking before the crash. But this time, even though affordability index is at a similarly difficult level, I don't anticipate any 30% price decline. 10% price decline in California is certainly a possibility, but for the rest of the country, it's probably going to be near zero, meaning that some market may see plus five, other markets may be minus five. No, not a drastic change from what occurred uh, in the past couple of years, so it's not going to damage homeowners, nor is it going to damage the financial institution. So the price change over the next year will be very minimal, either positive or negative in many, many markets uh, because we don't have those funny mortgages. And second, uh, we don't have oversupply. In fact, this is the inventory of homes on the market, the supply. Economics 101 would say too much supply will lead to prices needing to adjust. But as you can see, today's inventory level perhaps is a little above one year ago by small amount, but last year it was an acute inventory shortage. So you can say we are essentially at very similarly low inventory level. Of course, we have far fewer buyers, but look at the inventory condition back in the 2006 uh, period or during the housing market crisis. Four million homes on the market which would be four times larger than today's condition. And that is why the housing, at least the home prices, are on much firmer ground. The buyers are not there, but the supply is not there either. Uh, and consequently, the probability or the chance of another 30% price decline as happened in, say, 2010 will not happen uh, because of much solid foundation or reduction in inventory. Here's another indication that the homeowners are quite content and in a comfortable position. The number of home sales that is under foreclosure or needing a short sale, say someone who was in mortgage forbearance program, so they lost a job during COVID, unable to pay mortgage, so that balance was blooming up, uh, and now uh, they still cannot find job, they need to sell. Once they sell, the price they receive is unable to cover the mortgage, so you will be a short sales. Well, these distressed property sales are accounting for only 2% of the market, historically near low levels. Last year was 1%, so you went from 1% to 2%. Now, some journalists may write, oh, 100% increase in distressed property sales, but look at this graph. Essentially non-existent and certainly not the case of 35% or 40% being distressed property sales as happened in 2010 uh, period. So housing market again, or the home prices on much solid foundation. Home building in the meantime is lackluster. In fact, it's been lackluster for the past 10 years. Look what was happening to housing start in the year 2000, which may be considered a very normal then it began to increase, in a sense, oversupply before we encounter a housing crisis in 2008, 9, 10 period. But once the housing crisis was finished, foreclosure, property sales out of the way, home builders were still cautious. They were not building all that much. In fact, you can say we had a decade of underperformance by the single family uh, home builders. And, and that's why we had a housing shortage even before the arrival of COVID. So 2019 was a housing shortage. Housing shortage became acute shortage during COVID. Uh, and, but right now the builders are cutting back on production, 
Naturally, they're cautious with increased cancellation, but once home is completed, it is still selling fast. Uh, so perhaps builders need to put that into uh, equation because construct, once it's finished, they're still able to sell quickly at a profit uh, because uh, if the builders do not build and mortgage rates somehow retreats back down one year from now or two years from now, we could again encounter a housing shortage situation. Uh, in the meantime, the apartment building is very active. So you can see the situation on the apartment building is running at 40 year high. Uh, so, uh, the rents are rising and, and naturally the builders want to chase that high rising rent. Let me now flip to the broader economy. GDP measure is showing two consecutive quarters of a decline. Informally, it will be an economic recession. Officially, we have to wait until the committee who decide whether we are in recession or not. Now, one, in one sense, you can say we are producing less for six straight months. Maybe it should be a recession. You don't believe it? Well, check your retirement portfolio. Much of your wealth has evaporated. So another indication, perhaps we are in a recession. But this is a very bizarre recession if we are in one. We have a strength in the labor market. There are far more job openings as reflected in the blue line, help wanted sign, compared to people searching for job. So you see help wanted sign at a restaurant, but there's help wanted sign for truck drivers, delivery trucks, uh, help wanted sign at the nursing home, uh, help wanted sign at the uh, police. Uh, you know, there's a shortage of police officers across the country. So there's large degree of help want to sign, oh, the mechanics at the airline. So if you have a little mechanical failure, expect long, long delays uh, at the airport. So very bizarre recession if we are in an uh, official recession where labor market is quite strong in terms of the help want to sign that is out there. So somewhat of a mixed picture on the economy. Now, total number of people on a payroll job so those receiving steady income. Realtors, many realtors are not on steady income. They're on commission income, uh, and therefore their income fluctuates. But among those people who are receiving W-2 statement salary, this is the total number of jobs. We are now at a record high. More Americans are working today than ever before. Then you have to say, well, we have a population growth every year, so every year we should have a record. And what this graph shows that right before COVID and then lockdown, which smashed away 20 million jobs out of the picture, but with each passing month, more job creation, more job creation, such that we are now back at record high. Here is an interesting graph. State by state variation. Not all states have recovered equally. So looking at the latest information, September of this year, versus March 2020, right before COVID, in terms of employment numbers, we are seeing large variation. Green color is good. So if you look at Idaho, 7.1% means there is 7.1% more jobs in Idaho today versus March 2020. Florida is doing well, or, was, or at least was doing well right before the hurricane. North Carolina, Texas, Utah are so top performers. But the orange color would be the one they are still struggling. So you are looking at New York, Michigan, uh, still below what it was compared to pre-COVID days. Uh, so some variation, I'm sure you are honing into your state. Well, that is your numbers. So if you want to compare with the rest of the country, uh, that is how your state is performing. In the meantime, how do the consumers feel about the economy? According to University of Michigan survey, People are saying the economy stinks. So again, recession or not, but consumers are saying economy stinks because they are reminded at the grocery store, they're reminded at the gas station, and they're looking at their retirement portfolio. So not a good picture on consumer sentiment. Here's a even uglier picture related to home buying, real estate. Fannie Mae survey on a very simple question, is it a good time to buy? and people are expressing, nope, it's not a good time. Well, certainly we are seeing in the statistics with far fewer home sales, 
uh, maybe consumers are saying this because of higher mortgage rates or lack of choices, not enough inventory in the neighborhood they want to purchase. Only one show, home is showing up rather than say seven or eight, which they want to review. So people are saying it's not a good time to buy. Only caveat to this graph is what people say and what people actually do do not match up. Look at the middle of the graph, 2020 and 2021, housing market boom. But was there an increase in people who say they want to buy? No, they remain the same. So it looks like consumers will act if the conditions are right. If somehow the mortgage rate retreat a bit or more inventory show up, maybe they want to buy. They want to strike and make a deal. But the sentiment today remains very, very low. We know that inflation is painful. Inflation is frustrating. But is there any benefit to inflation? And history shows us when there is an unexpected inflation, there is a wealth redistribution, wealth redistribution to the debtors over the creditors. And debtors benefit because amount of the money they borrow essentially becomes less heavy than before with inflation. For a quick illustration, let me just quickly run these numbers. Assuming a person takes out a $350,000 mortgage at today's 7%, their monthly principal and interest will be 2329. Most people are taking out a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. So let's say that payment is the same next year and down the line. The middle column is people's income. I'm using a household with $80,000 annual income, translating monthly to 6667. That's their monthly income. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, people's wages today are rising by 5%. 5% increase in salary, people should celebrate, except it's not time to celebrate because grocery bills are rising even faster than that. So it's actually a declining in standard of living, but nonetheless, people are still receiving higher pay. Social security check recipients, next year will get an 8% cost of living adjustment. So high inflation, at least there is some degree of increased income generation. So the following year, uh, you see that incomes are rising and rising, assuming we have this persistent high inflation in the upcoming years. But if you look at the last column, very simple math, amount of debt payment, mortgage debt payment in relation to income steadily diminish. So again, indicating that if there is an inflation, at least debtors benefit to some degree. Let's use another scenario. Let's say inflation disappears in a couple of years. If that's the case, this table no longer is relevant. But what is relevant is that if inflation disappears in a couple of years, the mortgage rate will not be at 7%. It will be at 5% or possibly even 4%. People can refinance into those lower interest rates. So very interesting situation today. Many people simply cannot get a mortgage at 7%, but those who are able would face this table if we have high inflationary environment. But if the inflation dies away, then people can always refinance. So my final slide, the forecast for the housing market. First, let me look at the history. 2019 before COVID, very boring year in hindsight. No increase in sales, prices increased by only 4%. 2020 became exciting. 2021 became even more exciting for the housing market. But this year is a transition year, much higher mortgage rates. Once the December numbers are in, I think we will show about 15% reduction in sales, and it will continue into next year, assuming mortgage rate sticks at 7%. Home prices in the meantime, this year is already said it's gonna be above last year, but next year it will be essentially zero, meaning half of the country will see price gain, half of the country will see price decline. Gains and declines will be very minor, plus minus, plus five or minus five. Only exception would be markets like California uh, where you may encounter a 10% uh, decline. So thank you very much for uh, listening. And in fact, if I can just add one more minute because I did not cover commercial real estate as much, but on the commercial real estate, what we are finding is softness in the office market because of that remote work even the vacancy rates are misnomer. Washington DC vacancy rate of 15% officially, 
But you look at the actual building, it's more than half empty. People are not showing up, uh, half empty. So office market is tittering, uh, the wobbly condition, but the industrial commercial buildings are very strong. Apartment market is super strong. Retail market is in between where uh, it is beginning to recover, but not as strong as industrial or apartment. So thank you very much for listening. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Joan. Well, Lawrence, that was uh, quite an education, Economics 101 and 201, I believe, uh, with regard to the economy overall. And it's always nice to have different perspectives. I think you probably know I had uh, the, the Federal Reserve President, Neil Kashkari, uh, from the Minneapolis branch with us last week, and he, uh, he uh, sang pretty much the same song you were singing, which there's room for optimism, but there's also room for caution in uh, both the economy and the housing market. I wanna dig a little deeper too into the commercial uh, and industrial housing market in a minute. But what we like to do on these uh, programs is we like to turn the tables on our audience and just get a sense of how they're feeling about their own economic situation. So we're gonna put up a poll um, here in a second and uh, ask our audience to answer this poll. So if you've been in the market to purchase a home within the last year, how has the current market impacted you? So have you stopped looking because it's too expensive and mortgage rates are rising? Have you stopped looking because there's not enough inventory out there or you're still planning to go full bore ahead with your home purchase? So let's see how many folks in our audience uh, had a bit of caution here. And then I'm gonna ask you to comment uh, as to whether or not this is what you're seeing in your, your data. So you're previously thinking about buying a home, but the last several months has caused you to change your outlook. 63% of our viewers say that's true for them. 15% uh, said because there's not enough inventory. And we have the bold and the brave, 22% uh, saying they're going ahead anyway without regard to the current condition. So is this uh, pretty much jive with what you're seeing? Uh, you know, certainly the sales are down because, you know, people are saying it's too expensive or they cannot get a mortgage. Just to put a little context on the mortgage, mortgage rate at 3%, say someone was, you know, taking out a mortgage and they said, well, only thing that I can afford is monthly payment of, say, $1,300 per uh, month. At today's 7%, that number changes. It suddenly goes from $1,300 to near $2,000. So people talk about being angry at the grocery store, at the gas station, people want to buy a home. I mean, it's just, uh, they're a complete shock. They simply cannot uh, get a mortgage. So I think for some people, they're in that situation, but those with financial capability, even at 7%, they're still hesitant uh, because of you know, the affordability being a uh, very challenging condition. So uh, there is even hesitancy among those people with cash. Okay, um, again, I refer back to Neil Kashkari, who we had on the program, and he said that he sees little evidence that core inflation has peaked right now. And so I guess, I, you know, you looking at all this data and all these numbers, do you feel that core inflation has peaked or you still we have, do you think we have a ways to go? Oh, well, the gasoline prices are definitely past peak. It's much lower than what it was uh, during the uh, summer months. I mean, it's still high, uh, but it is uh, not, as high as what it happened in the summer months. Uh, and then you look at the food prices, which is still rising, but gas and food are outside of the core. So core inflation is what the Federal Reserve is looking at. And what is the big component of the core? It is rents. And the rents are still rising. Some of the private sector information is showing deceleration, meaning that it may be rising more slowly now than before. But when I look at the actual figure, the deceleration means the rents were rising at 15%, but now it's rising at 8%, while the official Bureau of Labor Statistics data is showing acceleration, going from 6% to 7% to 8% increase in rent. Uh, so so uh, the core inflation, I mean, maybe a few additional months, uh, at least on the rent component, before it begins to show the peaking condition. This might be in the weeds a little bit, but I think it's important to define what is core inflation uh, relative to just general inflation? What is the difference? And, and when we think about these statistics that come out every month, what is the difference between core inflation uh, and regular inflation? Oh, it's, it's, you know, for most people, regular inflation is what they're looking at. How much are they paying uh, for stuff? Uh, while the core inflation, in essence, uh, is trying to remove volatile factors, 
because in the past, gasoline prices tend to be very volatile up and down, and we do not want, or the economists do not want to panic the public to say, oh, we have high inflation, even though it could be a very temporary situation. Food prices also tend to be very volatile, so the intent of the core inflation is let's remove the volatile component and let's focus on slow moving prices uh, and like college tuition, medical bill, or those are more slow moving prices uh, and, uh, and rents. So that will be the core inflation. Okay, thank you for that. So do you have any concerns? Let's talk about your last slide with your forecast. Um, you know, with the slowdown in the market, interest rates rising, mortgage rates, what about home valuation? So someone may have bought a home last year or the last couple of years during COVID, uh, paid a higher price, uh, but you're saying you're not so worried about valuations dropping like we saw maybe in 2008. Can you kind of explain the difference in the markets from the kind of the financial crisis and mortgage crisis in 2008 versus where we are today with regard to values dropping? Uh, so the values back in the financial crisis in 2008, the Great Recession, it declined 30%, 35%. And I think in uh, some Florida and Phoenix market, it declined 50%. So these are massive decline in home prices. This time we will not see that uh, for the reason that first we don't have those subprime lending, we don't have enough supply. Uh, so, you know, those are the major uh, differences, but the affordability is still raising alarm. You know, affordability is very, very difficult uh, condition. So. I mentioned about California market where I do anticipate about 10% price decline, uh, which means say someone who bought a million dollar home uh, is now looking at 900,000. I mean, that's a hundred thousand dollar reduction in wealth. Uh, people may say it's sort of paper wealth. Uh, maybe if they wait five more years, it will recover. But nonetheless, they feel like they lost hundred thousand dollars for recent home buyers. But at the same time, Californians who bought home two years ago, they're smiling big because prices have risen by 30%. So you gain 30, you give up 10, so they're overall happy. And the other factor is that they locked in on those low interest rate, 3%. In fact, I would say there are a good portion of home buyers of the past two years who would say, I would not be homeowners today at 7%, but thank God I got that 3% and I was able to enter. Great. And do, do you think those folks who got the 3%, uh, whether in the last couple of years or the last five years or so, do you think they're saying to themselves, I'm going to stay here for a very, very long time. I'm not going to maybe move out of that starter home for a while because I can't afford that 7 maybe 8% mortgage. So you think, you think the shortage in inventory has to do with people saying, I'm not going to give up my low interest rate mortgage. Is that is that part of the shortage right now too? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, you know, people are loving their 3%. So just consider a, a family who has a new child into the family. Uh, and they said, well, let's have a buy a house with extra bedroom. And then they said, well, 3%, do we have to give up 3% for extra bedroom? Nope, we love our 3% more. So they got to stay put uh, in the cramped house. Uh, and that's the situation. But to be more uh, economic statistician, last time mortgage rate changed uh, some meaningful amount. Uh, was when Ben Bernanke was the chair of the Federal Reserve and there was a taper tantrum where he mentioned something and the market reacted to uh, what he had mentioned and the mortgage rate quickly moved from, uh, I believe like uh, 4% to 6%. And during that time period, we saw the listing decline by 12% just because of that changes in mortgage rates. Today, mortgage rate difference are even larger uh, than what happened during Ben Bernanke. So we expect even more pe people to stay put. Okay, picking up on another Fed official again, back to Kashkari, because he said something that kind of really was interesting to me as an economist. He said the danger of us, quote, talking ourselves into recession, just by saying we're in a recession, that really affects how people behave and consumer spending, as you know, is the one that juices the GDP numbers. So how do you think the inflation fears and recession fears play into how we act in our daily lives? Is it is it true that we could just by continuing to talk about a recession, uh, throw ourselves into a recession from a consumer spending standpoint? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, one thinks about uh, some of the great uh, orators of the past, say FDR, uh, Ronald Reagan, Winston Churchill, Barack Obama, uh, where uh, they could talk and boost the confidence of the country. And if people feel confident, they say, yeah, I feel secure about the situation, so I can buy that uh, couch uh, for my home. I can uh, spend more money into the economy. 
uh, but that consumer sentiment index that I showed you, uh, which is very low. So it's possible that consumers could be talking themselves into a recession and not spend money, which then leads to actual recession. Uh, so, so people say the confidence is one of the cheapest way to stimulate the economy. It doesn't require tax cut. It doesn't require government spending. Can we boost the confidence? And then confidence itself would lead to better economic activity. Okay. Uh, interesting. In this political election year, right? Politicians talking about that the economy is, is still going strong. And there's evidence, obviously, in the unemployment numbers. Uh, the payroll numbers are quite good. Uh, getting a number of questions in from our audience, uh, specifically about different markets. So you talked about the California market. Uh, you talked to us being, you know, the Florida market, Texas market being, quote, hot. What are some of the other markets around the country? I know you had the map up there. But what are the hottest markets right now for real estate? And then maybe the coolest markets, the ones that you're a little more worried about. Can you give us, other than California, maybe Florida and Texas, a little more granular detail? What about the Mid-Atlantic? What about kind of the Rust Belt states? Uh, well, uh, so to answer that question, I actually have to go back in time uh, because uh, this year everything is uh, weak. Everything, every market uh, appears to be a uh, weakening condition. Uh, but just going back to time just a little bit, one is looking at Austin, Texas, Nashville, Denver, Salt Lake City, Boise, Idaho, just booming. Uh, Seattle was doing super well. Uh, so you saw various market, and then generally the southern state, Florida market was uh, uh, booming. What's happening today is every market is seeing reduction in sales. Prices are decelerating, meaning that it is still up from one year ago, but the appreciation is slowing. Among the top performers, even in this environment, I was characterized as more affordable market with good job condition. So one is looking at places like Raleigh, North Carolina, or the Research Triangle, uh, Charlotte, uh, the Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, is doing a quite strong uh, condition. Uh, while the weakness would be uh, more towards the North New England states, with the exception of Maine. Maine is somehow getting this remote workers from New York City, Boston to come over to Maine. So Maine is holding on relatively well. Uh, so these are some of the variation uh, condition. Okay. Um, I, I want to shift to the affordability of maybe the first time home buyer out there. We have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, talking about the median price uh, and affordability. So according to the New York Times, they reported recently that can it now take more than a decade, more than a decade for that typical US first time buyer to really actually afford the, the down payment uh, on even a modest home. And we, we also learned that the uh, average age for a first time home buyer is now up to 33 years old. I mean, that's the highest I think we've ever seen. So uh, what do we need to do to keep the dream of home ownership you know, within reach for our young people who may be getting married later, maybe having kids later, but they still want to own that American dream and they're facing those really high rents in uh, especially the downtown uh, you know, inner city areas? Uh, you know, we saw the uh, population bulge of the baby boomers uh, and then you know, they had uh, uh, the, the home ownership opportunities. But the children of the baby boomers, uh, essentially the echo boomers or today's millennials, are larger in size. If you were to go to any uh, Main Street America, randomly ask people, how old are you? Uh, and people would say, oh, I'm 17, oh, I'm 45. But the peak number, the largest number in population is actually the age 30, 31, 32. These are the prime first time buyer age. So we have more Americans at this age. What's happening to the first time buyers? It is at historically low percentage. So first time buyers should be buying active in today's market condition, but because of affordability challenges, they are being shut out. And consequently, it doesn't mean 20 years delay to save up for down payment. Well, you know, you are looking at people in their 50s. So surely we cannot allow, allow that for the, our country. Uh, and that's why it's critical to have increased supply. Increased supply will moderate home prices, let the income catch up, how do we increase supply? Maybe there's a natural uh, profit incentive for the builders build, to build, but more on the affordable size, it's hard to do. So some type of tax credit to build affordable housing or increase uh, government spending dedicated to uh, home building, meaning that infrastructure spending that was passed, maybe some money could be carved out uh, and to say, use this money to build more homes. You know, that will certainly help uh, increase supply and provide better access 
for the millennial generation to realize what many people consider to be the American dream. Okay, we're, we're really hopeful on that one. Um, I want to talk about supply chain issues because we see oil shocks around the world. Of course, OPEC plus uh, just, of course, restricted the supply uh, of, of gas and, and oil. Um, but there are also other supply chain issues going on in Asia, getting different computer chips and other components for home builders, labor, uh, lumber prices and labor prices. Uh, are both going up. So are things improving for the home builders? And do you see that as a bright spot given the, um, the lack of inventory? Do you think the home building industry is gonna take this opportunity to really double down on more inventory or not? Uh, at least the overall supply chain issue is beginning to steadily diminish, which is a good thing. But the material cost going into construction is still running above consumer price inflation. Consumer price inflation is up 8%. Construction material costs are rising at 15%. The lumber prices are no longer doubling, fortunately, and you know it has definitely come down from the peak, uh, but it's still higher cost. And uh, I'm here in Washington, there's some construction activity as I walk past it. There's help on the side, we need bricklayers. Uh, so, so you know, as the, uh, we cannot build more homes or need to pay higher wages, all that is eating into the final price of the home. So, uh, you know, supply chain is still an issue out there. Okay, let's shift for a moment and we're gonna get more to, more to uh, audience questions, but I wanna talk about the uh, commercial real estate market in a lot of downtown areas. You mentioned the Washington DC area, a lot of the federal government employees are not back to their offices on a full-time basis. So what do you think about these, uh, these leases that are coming due in the next year or 18 months and companies actually reducing their footprint in the cities. How do you think that's going to affect? Do you think that commercial real estate will eventually turn into residential condos or other apartment buildings? Is that a possibility? How are you thinking about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the uh, we will have a oversupply of office just because of less usage. I think many corporations, large organizations are rethinking uh, what is the right hybrid model. And at the same time, a, a company may own eight floors of a building. And they say, well, we don't need eight floors. Maybe we can lease out another four floor. So a large number of vacant properties will begin to show up on the market in the upcoming years. Uh, and the question is, what happened to this vacant spaces? Can it be converted into where we are short? We are short on housing. So maybe we can be turned into, uh, you know, whether uh, it is affordable housing, age restricted, senior housing, but any type of housing is where we have a shortage. Uh, but trying to make the numbers work is very difficult. And that's why tax credit or government spending to make those conversion uh, would be needed. Okay, I want to I want to talk about the parallels between being a, a real estate agent and an insurance agent because there was a time over the last decade or so that the realtors were very worried about the uh, the new apps that came along and you might not need a realtor to do a transaction you might just do this all on one of the apps the many apps realtor.com Zillow etc. Uh, that are out there. And then insurance agents worried for many years that the direct to consumer, uh, that people would be purchasing insurance online without the need of a trusted advisor like an insurance agent. So I think there's a lot of parallels here because that didn't, that didn't materialize. We still very much have a trusted uh, advisor in the real estate agent, agent group. And we very much have a trusted advisor when we buy an insurance policy. So how do you think about that? And how do you think our realtors and our insurance agents can succeed in this new normal of inflation and high interest rates? Uh, you know, first, uh, you know, one has to admire all the uh, technological innovation, uh, more competition into the space. That's all good. Uh, but we have to let the consumers speak. And the consumers have said, I want to work with the realtors. I want to uh, work with actual person, uh, insurance agent, uh, because in terms of the real realtors, they are essentially making a most expensive purchase for most people in, in America. So they want that to be a sound, secure, right decision. And second, People want to protect that with insurance. So they don't want to just blindly, just randomly do a few computer clicks uh, to get an insurance. Uh, so we have to let the consumers speak and the consumers have said, we want to work with trusted advisors when making a home purchase or in terms of getting an uh, insurance. Uh, but we, uh, 
always welcome technological competition innovation, but we have to let the consumers speak and the consumers are saying they feel comfortable with working with actual trusted professionals. Okay, a question coming in from the audience about building codes and post hurricane Ian, obviously in Florida and other wildfire areas. I mean, do you, how do you think about the rebuilding in some of these very, uh, very volatile areas where climate change has really uh, been impactful? Uh, does the realtors have a position on, you know, should these communities be rebuilt in the same places that could get, get wiped out again, either through hurricane, flooding, or wildfire? Uh, how do you think about uh, the rezoning and the building codes in some of these areas? Uh, you know, anytime uh, if it's a repetitive event in the same location, one has to wonder why build the same house when it's a continuous repetitive event. Things like tornado, one really do not know where it will hit. So, you know, one cannot really say, well, you cannot build there because we don't know where it will land. Wildfires, is it predictable, repetitive events, or is it really unpredictable? But clearly hurricanes are fairly predictable as to where it will hit. Uh, like in Florida markets, I'm sure within the next five years, another big one will hit. So the question becomes, how do we provide insurance in a repetitively hit events? It has to be properly uh, assessed, actuar actuarially uh, sound, uh, a little tripping up on the actuarial insurance uh, terminology. Uh, so it should be sound. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you look at, say, a widow who may be living along the Florida coast, uh, they have a fixed income, they knew what their flood insurance rate would be, but we cannot simply double that rate just next year. So any increases should be done in a manageable way. I don't know what, what that manageable increases are. Is it 10%? Is it 15%? How it is? Or, or should the federal government actually buy out some of the homeowners to say, okay, we will buy your properties and we will resettle you someplace else. Uh, and then, you know, once the next hit comes, there's no rebuilding in that area. Uh, but, you know, right, right now is subsidized in terms of some of the repetitive, like hurricane flood uh, is subsidized, uh, but that subsidy cannot be quickly taken out immediately in a one go. So it has to be, you know, steady adjustment. Okay, thank you for that. A question coming in from Greg Sample at Willis Towers Watson. How long will it take for multifamily units to catch up to demand and ease the spiraling cost of rents? Uh, I think we are almost there, uh, meaning that the we rents peak is probably occurring this year and next year rent increases should be moderating somewhat, but still rents are high and you know people's income is not able to catch up, uh, but that also again requires large degree of supply and even some tax credit funded building of affordable homes. Okay, a question coming in from Raymond Walsh. Does the strong dollar and tightening credit and money supply, is it likely exports will diminish with US jobs? Would you agree that job losses could change this picture dramatically? I mean, if job losses start to accrue, isn't that stagflation at this point? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. High inflation, sluggish economy, job losses, stagflation. Uh, you, we don't wanna see that. So high dollar, strong dollar just means that it's hard to export American products. Uh, and Americans want to eagerly buy foreign products because foreign products are cheap. I would be more concerned today about European economy. It looks like it's almost certain that European uh, economy will go into a recession just because uh, a very large uh, cost on energy, the terrible Ukrainian war that is occurring. So high energy costs. Uh, so some factories uh, in Germany may have to go through a blackout period, which means they're not producing the BMW to sell. So it's good that you will lead to a recession. And anytime there is a major area going through a recession, they will buy less of American products, not only the strong dollars, but they don't have the income to buy American products. So that could actually bring the U.S. economy even to a slower growth or even tilted towards negative. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a question from Victoria Cheng. Could you comment on renovations and additions to homes? Instead of maybe moving, uh, people are considering doing a renovation or an upgrade to an existing home. And what is your general, I know it varies by market and it varies by neighborhood, but uh, what is your general advice on renovations or additions versus moving? 
you know, we have seen a robust uh, reno remodeling activity the past couple of years. It's part of that remote work. So people love their home. They just want to make it, uh, redo it so that they have a dedicated space to do office related work at home. So we saw a good spending. But other part uh, is that they are now loving their 3% rate. They don't want to give that up. So additional child in the family, maybe they want to extend additional room, maybe a room over the garage, build it. So maybe that could be uh, something that people work on. So uh, I think the remodeling activity uh, will pick up as people are staying put a little longer. Certainly not a good news for our members, but we want to, uh, to assure the homeowners feel right financially. And you know, maybe they just love the neighborhood. They don't want to move out of it. And only way to readjust to some changing life's circumstance is to do remodeling. Okay, uh, this is a bit of an insurance question for you. So uh, Lisa Flowers wants to know, with financial constraints families are feeling now, does that impact, impact our potential seeing more claim frequency? So should we expect more insurance claim for smaller items, for example, as people don't have that extra funds to cover the smaller claims, do you think we're going to have more insurance claims coming Yeah, in? that one, uh, you seem like logically uh, there may be the case among people right on the margin. Uh, so, so that one, I really cannot provide the answer, but, uh, you know, logic would suggest there are people right on the margin just to, you know, looking for the last nickels and dimes and they see some issue, they may want to file a claim. Okay, what is your forecast? This is coming in from Dan Borgna. What is your forecast for kind of second or vacation homes in hot markets like in Florida or the Jersey Shore or, you know, as you say, Arizona? People have, uh, during COVID, realized they don't need to work from their primary residence and maybe can work from a second home. Do you think the vacation second home market will continue to stay hot or do you think that will have a greater uh, kind of uh, downtrend than just a primary home? Um, well, it saw a bigger increase during the boom of the past two years. So the vacation home resort area saw a bigger increase. Then this year is seeing actually bigger decline. I'm not sure whether that's due to some companies saying come back to work office, even if it's not five days. Uh, so maybe that's uh, leading to it. But here's my long term projection, meaning that 10 years from now, 10 years from now, having a second home will be a very common phenomenon. So Americans all have two car garage. We all have two automobiles in our garage, but having a two second home, I think will be very common, not by an individual family because it may be too expensive, but by extended family. This week I get to use. Next week, uh, my sister gets to use. The following week, my uh, uncle uh, gets to use because within the extended family, they're office workers and I'm sure they have schedules such that, well, I can work from home, but I don't want to work from home. I want to work in a resort destination. Uh, and therefore, I, I feel very optimistic about the resort vacation destinations. Wow, okay, interesting. That's that's a good positive outlook, I guess, um, for, for the second or vacation homes. Um, last question here from our audience, a lot of questions coming in about variable rate mortgages. So if people were looking to get into the home market this year or next year, uh, do you suggest them thinking about maybe a five-year arm or seven-year arm versus a 30-year fixed, hoping that market mortgage rates will be coming down in the, in the foreseeable future? Um, so I have a son uh, who is in his mid twenties, and you know he's wondering whether he should buy. And I said, if you decide to buy, go with the adjustable rate mortgage. And the reasoning for that is first, interest rates are low, and for younger people, it's never their final home; it's their starter home. And generally, they move in five, six, seven years. So at least during that time, their payment is fixed; it's not changing. Only after five years is changing, but it could actually change lower uh, with the inflation under control. But uh, the adjustable rate definitely offers lower interest rate in today's market versus 30 year fix. So that's the advice that I'm giving to my son. So, so I'll take it as is. Okay, great. I have a couple of those in their 20s too. And I, I think I'd give the same advice. Lawrence, I cannot thank you enough. This hour just flew by and we'd love to invite you back on our program in a year or so, just to give your outlook 
uh, for the housing market again to our audience. And we're just so grateful for you and everything the National Association of Realtors does do. Again, we're a big insurer of realtors out there with the e and insurance, and we're very proud. I think we were the first company in 1956 to have that offering, which I just learned. So we're a very proud supporter of the realtors and the whole housing industry. So good luck to you as you navigate these uh, next couple of years, and we'll hope to see you back on our show soon. Thank you. All right. And to my audience, I just want to give you a heads up. Watch your email boxes tomorrow. We're going to be announcing our November and December winter lineup. Uh, just to give you a sneak preview, uh, November 2nd, we're going to talk about the outlook for the trucking industry. The trucking industry was greatly impacted during COVID, and we're going to talk about the opportunities for 2023. Then on November 9th, we're going to be joined by award-winning author Susan McPherson, and she's going to share her tips from our new book, which we're giving away, as we always do, The Lost Art of Connecting for Building Those Meaningful Business Relationships. They've never been more important than they are today in our kind of remote and hybrid uh, environments. So she'll be fantastic. And then we're gonna talk to a former Pentagon official uh, on November 16th, Dr. Ian Brzezinski about the geopolitical risks and the geopolitical outlook, both for China, Russia, Ukraine, Europe, NATO. There's lots to talk about. So join us uh, when we host Ian Brzezinski on our geopolitical risk uh, event on November 16th. Uh, to close out November, we're going to be joined by the CPCU Institutes, uh, the, the people who put out the CPCU certification, their president, Peter Miller. And on November 30th, he's going to talk about what educational opportunities there are for agents and brokers uh, in 2023. So again, please fill out our survey. It's in the chat. We're so appreciative of all your time joining us on their programs, and we'll see you uh, next week. Take care.